Here's. Good evening. It is time for our Wednesday night midweek Bible study. And uh, we had a little bit of trouble with my other tablet today trying to do the Facebook Live. So we had to switch devices. And now it appears as though it is working. We are simultaneously videotaping today's Bible study with a high definition camera. So, uh, if all goes well, there we go, if all goes well, we'll be posting a better quality video than what you're seeing live uh, of the Bible study on our YouTube channel later this evening. And uh, so... Um, Hopefully, we'll, we'll see how this camera does. I just picked it up recently for this purpose. Trying to give a couple of minutes because uh, folks are going to need a chance to join us um, since we started a couple of minutes late, not but a few minutes late. Uh, I do want to make a quick report and let you know uh, last week, as most folks know, I was able to get up to New York and visit with a longtime friend and supporter of this ministry, uh, my friend Claude. He is in a rehab nursing facility uh, after a fall back in April, uh, during which uh, he lost his ability to walk. He was already having trouble with one of his legs. And then he fell and broke something or something. So anyway, they're trying to rehab him and uh, get him ready to go back home. He's got a young lady, a friend of his, and a longtime neighbor working with him to get his house uh, fixed up and in order so that when he gets home, he'll have a safe environment to be in. Um, and uh, he seems to be in good spirits. I'm also happy to report that uh, the minister there at the church he has attended for a good while finally showed up, and so he is getting some pastoral visits, and that makes me happy. Uh, that was a, a very deep concern of mine, but he does seem to be getting some visits there, so uh, I don't want to, you know, sound like I've been coming down on them real hard and then turn around and find out that finally they started. So I want to acknowledge that, and we're appreciative of that for Claude. And um, he's been very grateful. He was, I should say, he expressed deep appreciation for my coming up. I was able to spend a few hours with him on Thursday evening when I arrived, and then I was able to spend a couple more hours with him on Saturday before I left, I drove into my home state of Connecticut on Friday and spent about probably seven or eight hours um, driving around and reminiscing and all that fun stuff and visiting with my cousin. Um, you know, I requested prayer on Facebook for myself. Uh, uh, you know, I, I mentioned that I was making this trip and I was requesting prayer for myself. And then I mentioned, of course, Claude, and I said, he also needs our prayer. And one lady wrote, uh, well, I'm praying for Claude. And I found that a little odd. I thought, well, you know, why would she not say I'm praying for y'all or for both of you or whatever? And it was almost as if to me she was saying, well, his need merits prayer, yours doesn't. So I, I wrote her a little note and explained why I asked for prayer for myself to begin with. Because <clears throat> with my current uh, health constraints, making a trip like this, folks, is 
you just don't even know how hard it is for me to do. And um, I get winded just trying to go to Home Depot and walk through the store or go to Walmart. You know, I have to use one of those little electric carts to do anything nowadays because uh, too much physical activity and too much is not a lot, but too much activity and I'm completely worn out. And so, you know, flying a total of seven hours, including layover, you know, because I flew into Washington, D.C. on the way up, a layover of, of an hour and a half or two hours. Then I had to switch planes and fly, you know, from there to New York. And then I have to go to a car rental place and stand in line forever because they were packed in New York and uh, get the car. Then I have to drive uh, because of traffic in New York City. It literally took me 90 minutes to drive from the airport to Claude. And we're talking about 16 miles. That's all the distance. And it's primarily highway. That's the real kick. It's, I would say out of 16 miles, about 12 of it is highway. And the uh, Long Island Expressway was just bumper to bumper, literally moving at like three to five miles an hour at best. And uh, the whole way, and it's very stressful, I'm exhausted, I'm driving to Claude's, I get to Claude's, I spend a few hours with him, and finally he could tell just by looking at me that I was completely winded and wore out, and he said, you know, Charles, by all means, go ahead and go to the hotel and get some rest. Well, I figured since I was going to try to visit my cousin on Saturday, probably be best for me to drive in from New York that night, uh, Thursday night, and stay in the town she lives in at a motel there. That's the same town uh, where the church I grew up in is. And uh, that was a 90-minute drive that turned into a two-hour and something drive because of construction. There was an awful lot of nighttime construction. And so um, I got up early on uh, Friday morning because I wanted to have as much of the day to do whatever I could. And uh, I met with my cousin around lunchtime and we had lunch, we had a nice visit. And uh, I did a little more sightseeing, went to the ocean. You've seen pictures on Facebook of things that I did. Went to the park that I grew up going to and uh, I love that place. Boy, I'm going to tell you, that park to me is just heaven. I, I can't hardly explain to you folks how important that park was to me growing up because uh, whenever we would go there, and sometimes my brother Michael and my uncle Philip and I would go there and fish, and whenever we would go there, it was just so peaceful. And unfortunately, my home life was not peaceful. My home was not at all peaceful. And so I really relished peaceful places. And there were just a couple of places in my life at that time that were just uh, wonderfully peaceful. One of them was this park, and the other one was my great-grandmother's home. When we would go to Grandma's house, her house just had the peace of God on it. And I swear, when you went there, it was just the most peaceful place you ever wanted to be. My great-grandma never yelled. Here she was, a lady uh, back then in her uh, late 50s, early 60s. And... Uh, uh, she... Yeah, early 60s. And she had the patience of a saint with us grandkids. Even, I mean, even when we were three, four, and five years old, she had amazing patience. My, my great-grandmother had the most wonderful patience. And she never yelled at us. She never screamed at us. She never threatened us. She never beat us. 
none of the things that I was kind of accustomed to experiencing elsewhere. But so her house to me was heaven. My grandma, my, my mom's parents, we drove over there and my mother was the oldest of 10 children. So uh, a lot of the kids still lived at home and were unmarried when I was young. So my grandparents' house was hardly quiet and peaceful. And then my grandfather, bless his heart, uh, as I've mentioned in the past, he had quite, uh, he, he had quite a temper, and uh, he just, you know, flared up real easy and was yelling and griping a lot, you know. So anyway, so there were certain places that for me is where I could go and know that I could just experience tranquility and peace. Grandma, great grandma's house and uh, this park that I showed you pictures of uh, on Facebook. So anyway, by the time four o'clock rolled around on Friday, I was so completely beat. I mean, utterly exhausted out of my mind that I had to rent another hotel room uh, and uh, which of course I planned on doing but I rented a room I went into the room and I was out like a light within just a few minutes of crawling onto the bed I didn't wake up to call Tommy until like 10 10 30 so I literally slept for at least five hours or better uh, on Friday so I say all that to say this is why I had asked for prayer for myself because I knew that this trip was going to be taxing. And, I, and I'll tell you, God was good. The whole trip, you know, I did pretty well, all things considered. Um, but when I came home, I didn't even have the next day to try to recover from jet lag because we had church Sunday. So I did church Sunday, I did the video editing and all the fun stuff that I do after church. And Tommy, I'll tell you, poof, I was out like a light. Um, Monday, I could not wake up all day Monday. I got up briefly, I had breakfast because I'm being diabetic, I have to eat breakfast and stuff. So I got up, I had breakfast and all that. And then I, I set up for maybe an hour and then I had to turn around and go right back to bed again. I, my body was just so beat. And then the same thing happened to me yesterday. Tommy again could tell you. So recovering from that trip uh, has taken me almost as long as the trip itself was. So, you know, that's why I ask for prayer. I don't understand why when you ask for prayer, people don't just in good faith understand you. You must have some reason for asking mm -hmm. for prayer. Um, this particular person almost made me feel like, like she thought I was being selfish to ask for prayer for me, when really in her mind, you know, Claude was the one who deserved prayer. But I had my reasons for asking. You might tell my voice is a little bit hoarse today, and uh, I've been to the allergist this afternoon. And uh, they did some really extensive testing. They tested me for about 40 different allergens. Uh, the doctor came back in at the end of it all and said uh, she found out I had quite a few allergies, which, of course, we kind of guessed. And my primary care physician in Dallas had told me years and years ago that I couldn't get allergy shots and she said it had something to do with my liver function or my kidney function. Well I mentioned this to the allergist today and the allergist shook her heads and no, no, that that doesn't have nothing to do with nothing. So for years again I've been suffering. It's just like I did with the diabetes, you know. Uh, I suffered with that for many, many years, knowing pretty much that I was probably diabetic, it runs in my family, all the symptoms were there, so on and so forth. But in spite of bringing it up to my doctor on several occasions, 
I was just dismissed summarily, and he never even looked into it. Then when I got a new doctor came in uh, to the clinic that I worked through, she immediately tested me when I told her, you know, it runs in my family. My great-grandfather lost both of his legs to diabetes, so on and so forth. And they found out immediately that I was not only diabetic, but my numbers were insanely high. And the doctor even told me, she said, it's a miracle that you haven't gone blind. She said, this level of diabetes could easily have affected your eyes and cause you to go blind. So anyway, so you see how God watches your back. You see how the Lord, this is why I say, folks, we don't know how often the Lord is watching our back, and we're not even aware. We're, we don't have a clue. But He is covering us, and He's taking care of us. Even when we don't know, we have issues to take care of. And uh, then now, the same thing with my allergy. I've been suffering miserably with horrible allergies for many years. It's probably been eight or ten years at least. Because I don't remember them being real bad from the get-go in Dallas. But anyway, but uh, it's been at least eight or ten years, maybe even longer. And it's, it's affected my ability to sing regularly because I, I just... My allergies are so bad, I have no breath control, I can't hit notes, you know, I sound like a chicken with my head chopped off, and I feel so embarrassed trying to lead worship, and I'm squawking, and, you know, uh, just sounding awful. But anyway, and this doctor told me today, she said, you definitely could benefit from uh, allergy shots, so I'm going to be looking into that, making sure my insurance covers it, and God willing... I'll be able to do that, and who knows, maybe I'll actually be able to sing a special now and again in church again. You know, when I started my first church, I told you, when when we start this Bible study, I'm starting out with a little bit of chatter. I'm trying not to go more than roughly 20 minutes, okay? But I'm doing it on purpose. I'm trying to buy people time to get, get here and get connected with us, okay? Um, what was I starting to say now? Um, oh, well, it went right out of my head. But, oh, when, when I started my first church, I've never been able to play a musical instrument. Uh, that's been one of the biggest regrets in my life. Uh, I did not grow up in a family where musical talent was nurtured, encouraged, or whatever. Uh, never was. None of my brothers, uh, Dallas kind of does, but that's from some experience he had staying in a home with some folks who had kids that played and everything. But anyway, um, unlike most Pentecostal preachers, I've never had the ability to play an instrument. But one thing uh, I always could do back in the day was sing. I didn't say I had a marvelous singing voice. I just said I could sing. I could hold a tune, and you know. And um, I asked the Lord when I was young, and he called me to preach. We had a pastor, the same pastor, when, when Brother uh, <clears throat> Dr. Ward, you know, confirmed my calling. Um, Brother Barlow, bless his heart, he couldn't hold a note in a bucket. He could not. And then Brother uh, Harmon, who came after him, had a kind of an unusual voice, and Brother Harmon could not sing either. He, he sounded like something out of a cartoon. And so I always prayed, Lord, whatever you do, Lord, please let me be able to sing. I want to be, you know, I don't want to be one of those pastors who squawks like a chicken. Let me at least be able to sing. Well, when I started my, well, when I used to evangelize as a young person, I was always able to sing. And that kind of augmented my ministry, you know, kind of supported, helped my ministry. And uh, I even had some tone-deaf people come up and ask me if I had any records, you know. And uh, when I started my early churches, we didn't have any, any, any kind of worship accompaniment music 
uh, although in my very first church we did start out with a fella that played acoustic guitar uh, for a while and then after a few months we added a keyboardist and then we had a gal that played clarinet we had another fellow that played drums we had another uh, person that played I want to say trumpet and uh, so we wound up with several instruments within the first six months of my first church uh, for me but anyway but even without my ability to play an instrument I could at least sing every service I could sing a special and use a soundtrack so that kind of gave us some music you know and so just being able to sing helped you know and uh, anyway so I'm praying I said Lord you know I love to worship you I love to sing and so I'm praying that if we can get these allergies under control I'll be able to sing again okay all right I've talked enough chatter hopefully people will be finding us I don't see a whole lot at the moment um, but hopefully folks will find us I was so thrilled last week we had a large number of viewers live uh, today however here locally in the Huntsville Alabama area there are some pride events going on so it's possible that any local folks we had watching last week might be otherwise uh, preoccupied today but we are recording this Bible study as always so we'll be able to share it on our YouTube uh, later this evening and it'll be available for anyone who wants to watch it we are embarking as of last week our first week back uh, we are embarking upon a study on the gifts of the Spirit and uh, last week we began with the passage of Scripture 1st Corinthians 12 verses 1 through 11 and uh, I, I do want to kind of give you an idea of how the study is going to work real quick I have uh, this passage is where we're beginning and that is so that we can get a basic understanding or let me rephrase that a clear understanding of the nine gifts of the Spirit once we have done that we then are going to be kind of breaking down the gifts in a number of different ways we're going to be looking at how the gifts uh, are used in worship we're going to be looking at uh, how the gifts function within the church we're going to be looking at uh, instructions by the Apostle Paul as to how the gifts should be managed within the church service uh, we're going to be looking at uh, specific gifts a little more uh, well a lot more uh, carefully you see certain gifts certain of these gifts if you remember last week the Apostle Paul said there are diversities of gifts there's a variety of gifts but the same spirit there are differences of administrations but the same Lord and there are diversities of operations but it is the same God which worketh all in all and uh, I talked about the fact that you know each gift kind of operates differently they they have different functions they serve different purposes uh, one thing I didn't mention last week that I want to mention today we were talking last week about a word of knowledge excuse me a word of wisdom that's the first gift on the list that Paul gave us in 1st Corinthians 12 and uh, I failed to mention that the gifts kind of fall into two different categories there are gifts which operate almost on a uh, circumstantial basis in other words the Lord will will utilize that gift through someone in a given situation or in a given circumstance they don't run around with that gift 
Okay. In other words, that it's almost like it's a temporal, it's a temporary thing. Word of knowledge and word of wisdom fall into this category. You don't have the gift of knowledge. That is not the gift. The gift is a word of knowledge. It's a big difference. That simply means that God will use an individual. He will drop something. Uh, excuse me, a word of wisdom is what we were talking about last week. We're going to talk about word of knowledge today. But the Lord will drop a word. He'll drop something in their spirit to speak to someone that at that moment that word is needed. Okay, that word of wisdom, that instruction that provides the perfect answer for that given situation. The Lord can use a word of wisdom or a word of knowledge for that matter um, in anybody. Sometimes a uh, word of wisdom and word of knowledge, the Lord will use the most unlikely people in the church. The poorest woman in the church doesn't have a nickel to her name. And, but you know what? God will use her to give somebody a word of wisdom or a word of knowledge. That's why this, this is one tool that God uses to help keep us humble and to help keep us connected one to another. You know, the Word of God talks about when a situation arises in the church that requires judgment. You know, it requires that somebody kind of sit as a judge and hear both sides and determine what to do. Uh, the Apostle Paul talked about taking someone from the church that's least esteemed. You know, not taking one of the highfalutin uh, royalty members in the church. Every church has got them. You know, every church has got uh, the family that's been there the longest, that has the most roots, you know, uh, that has the strongest connection to the history of the church, or maybe they have the strongest relationship with the pastor. Um, whatever the case might be. And a lot of times, folks, you know, a lot of people begrudge that when someone has a strong relationship with the pastor. But you know what? When you've started churches like I have over the last 40 almost years, um, you develop relationships with people, especially, especially people who have been with you since the beginning. You know, when you've got people that have been with you for 40 years, you're likely to kind of have a, a strong relationship with them. You know them better. You know, uh, you probably have sat down to meals with them hundreds of times. You know, that sort of thing. A pastor has to be careful that he doesn't allow himself to be exclusively, you know, at the disposal of the Royalty, I call it, within the church, you know. Uh, at Riverside Church of God in Fort Worth, uh, Brother Gillum had some folks who had been in the church, you know, since he started it way back in the beginning. And uh, these folks were kind of looked at as church royalty, so to speak, you know. And in a, in a manner, these are the people, when I was preaching Sunday and I was talking about shepherds, and then the Lord referred to the principles of the flock. That's really the principles of the flock. That is the people within the church, like your elders, your deacons, those who have been there the longest, those who have the strongest leadership abilities or the most influence, you know. And if somebody in the church has great influence, uh, because of their length of time in the faith or length of time in the church, whatever the case may be, then you need to be aware and they need to be aware that God is going to hold them to a higher standard. Sure he is, of course he is, you know. To whom much is given, much is required. Um, if you're supposed to be 
an elder brother or an elder sister in the faith, uh, then just like a parent requires more of the eldest children, so God is going to require more of those in the church who should know better than to do certain things or should know better than to act certain ways or should know to take young believers under their wing and nurture them. Uh, there used to be a term in the church years ago that we used, and when someone would come to the Lord and they first were converted, a lot of times, especially the women, the Bible said, let the older women teach the younger women, right? And what would happen is, an older saint in the church, one of the women who had been in the faith for a while, would kind of take that new convert under her wing. And we would call them a mother in Zion. You know, it's, and this is where in the black church you get that phrase, mother. And they refer to church mothers. Well, the whole idea of that is that they're nurturing, that they take the younger women and they nurture them and they help to train them. You know, there ought to be a lot of um, support and encouragement within the church, even instruction, but know your, know your limits. There's, there are certain things that uh, the ladies in the church need to leave to the pastor. But then there are other things where it doesn't hurt at all for a mother in Zion or a mother in the church to take a young woman under a wing. Uh, and uh, so getting back, the, the gifts, there are some gifts which operate, you know, on a as-needed basis. Now, the interesting thing is, if you are obedient, to the voice of the Lord. If the Spirit of the Lord can work through you, for instance, with a word of wisdom, and the Lord knows, well, you know what? When I tap Tommy's shoulder and I drop a word of wisdom in his, in his thinking, he speaks it, he shares it, and he does a great job with it. So obviously, you know what's going to happen? He's going to use you more in that area. Same thing with the word of knowledge, the same thing. If, if the Lord's able to use you in a word of knowledge, he'll use you frequently. Uh, there are people in the church that you can know uh, that the Lord operates through them with a word of wisdom, or the Lord operates through them with a word of knowledge when it's necessary. Um, but interestingly enough, you don't, you don't, how can I say this? You don't necessarily seek after a word of wisdom. You don't necessarily seek after a word of knowledge. But you need to recognize them when they come. And obviously, if there's somebody in the church and it's known that, boy, the Lord really speaks a word of wisdom through this guy pretty frequently, or the Lord really speaks a word of knowledge through this person frequently, then you know when they come to you and they say, you know, the Lord laid something in my spirit to share with you, and this is what he told me to share with you. Because that's basically a lot of times how it will come. And uh, you know this person has a reputation for being used of the Lord in a word of wisdom or in a word of knowledge. But those are temporal. Again, I repeat, you're not a mind reader. You're not a fortune teller. You're not, a, you're not able to predict the future. Uh, this is a mistake, folks, that a lot of, even a lot of uh, spirit-filled people make. Uh, there's been a lot of erroneous teaching, even in Pentecostal circles. A lot of times you'll hear people refer to the gifts of uh, word of wisdom and word of knowledge. I have heard many times growing up, people refer to the gift of knowledge or the gift of wisdom. No, 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 no. No, no, no. A person can have wisdom, and again, you can know who the people in your in the church are who uh, 
possess wisdom and possess great wisdom. Those are the people you want to go to when you're in a tight spot and you're looking for the wisest thing to do, you know, and you really don't know what to do. That's why when I was going through my experience with my mom uh, back in the uh, early 80s and I needed to know what to do, I really was stumped. I wanted to do the right thing. I wanted the outcome to be the best possible outcome at every level. So I went to Brother Gillum. Why did I go to Brother Gillum? Simply because he was my pastor? No, I went to Brother Gillum because Brother Gillum was a very wise man. But when Brother Gillum offered me a, res a response, you know, and, and he offered me uh, the answer, as it were, to my dilemma, I knew that I was not simply hearing his wisdom. Are you following what I'm trying to say, Tommy? Are you hearing me? I wasn't just hearing Brother Gillum's wisdom, even though I know he was a very wise man. But I knew there was a witness in my spirit that I was hearing a word of wisdom. That God had specifically dropped that in his spirit to deliver to me. Okay? Um, sometimes, folks, sometimes the Lord will use somebody in a word of wisdom and in a word of knowledge. And I'm going to get into a word of knowledge in a minute. Uh, and quite honestly, they don't even realize it. They, they, they don't even realize that the Lord, the Lord just used you to deliver a word of wisdom. Uh, the, the saints in the church who have been here a while and they know how the gifts work and what have you, sometimes it is incumbent upon them to help especially young believers, understand, honey, you just received a word of wisdom. What? <laughs> when so-and-so told me, do thus and so, you see, that young saint, that young believer may not recognize what came to them was through the Holy Ghost. This was a word of wisdom from the Spirit of the Lord. And so sometimes those of us been in this thing a while, we may feel when they're talking to us, they say, well, you know, Brother Jones said that I should do thus and so, you know. All of a sudden, I've been in this thing a while, and I feel the witness of the Holy Ghost. Oh, boy, you received a word of wisdom, honey. Now, why would it be wise for me to confirm that to this young believer? Well, because they may not appreciate they may not understand what they just received. And therefore, as the elder brother in the faith, it's not a bad idea for me to help them understand. The Lord just spoke to you. That's what you need to do. The Lord just delivered a word of wisdom to you. You follow what I'm saying? And, uh, but the Lord can use people in a word of wisdom, and they don't even realize it. There are times in settings where you're having a group discussion, you know, and someone says something, and then all of a sudden, one of the believers will turn around and offer a word to, to another believer, and I'll be sitting there, and I'll see what's happening. And I realize, aha, the Lord just delivered a word of wisdom through this. So what am I going to do? I'm going to tell that person. Say, brother, i got news for you. Brother Jack just gave you a word of wisdom. Or Brother Paul or Sister Jane just gave you a word of wisdom. That was from the Holy Ghost. That wasn't just, you really need to heed that because that was divinely offered to you in direct response to the situation that you're trying to navigate your way through. So there are some gifts that are kind of circumstantial, they're kind of temporal, while they may operate through certain individuals on a regular basis, that person does not possess the gift of knowledge or the gift of wisdom. No. But the gift that operates through them is a word of knowledge. 
And it is a gift when God operates through us to do anything like this of a supernatural divine nature. It is a gift because you are, he is using you to be a help and a blessing and encouragement to give wise counsel, to give good instruction to another believer. He's using you to strengthen the body and to strengthen the fellowship and to strengthen the brotherhood. So yes, it's a gift. It's, it's kind of a, you know, a, 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 a temporal kind of a thing, but it's still a very important gift, okay? And, uh, but then there are gifts, there are other gifts that are, they do become the possession of the individual. When we start getting into the gift of prophecy, when we start getting into the gift of diversity of tongues, um, of the gift of faith, these, these are gifts that actually the individual comes into full possession of. And they operate in this gift regularly. There are people in the church growing up as a kid I knew individuals the Lord used regularly to offer word of wisdom, to you offer word of knowledge. I also knew people in the church that had the gift of faith. Honey, I'm going to tell you what, if you needed somebody to pray for you, that was the person to have pray for you. Because they could believe God to move mountains. I mean, they did. There wasn't whew, I, I'm feeling the Holy Ghost just talking about it. They could believe God for anything and everything. They had no limitations on their ability to genuinely believe the Lord. You know, I've talked about, in the past, I've talked about, um, I don't necessarily like to pray with everybody in the church. I've had people in our churches over the years that I, and I know I sound mean sometimes. I know people probably think I, I sound terrible. But there are some people that I've prayed with at prayer meetings and in church. Uh, and quite frankly, they don't know how to pray. They, they don't know the first thing in the world about how to pray. And, and I'm not talking about newbies. You know, I'm not talking about novices. I'm not talking about folks that are new to the thing. I'm talking about people been in this thing for decades and decades. And when I when I hear them pray, I'm like, good grief. That, you know, that that's the Bible said the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. So when I want to get down and pray with somebody, I want to get down and pray with somebody who knows how to pray. If I've got something that I really need to touch the Lord about, I want to get down and pray with somebody who knows how to touch the Lord, who has the faith to believe God, okay? Um, when we get to faith, I'll go into more detail. I don't want to jump the gun here. I'm trying to kind of do these studies in such a way that I'll later be able to go through and label them like one week, last week was the word of wisdom, okay? This week we're basically going to just cover word of knowledge. But at the same time, there's a lot of overlap, you know, and there's a lot of, of, of uh, peripheral truths we need to understand as well. So you've got gifts that are the possession of the recipient. You've got gifts that simply... Uh, on occasion, based on circumstance and situation, may operate through an individual, okay? But that gift is not necessarily uh, their possession. That gift just passes through them, okay? And so it's important to understand that. Now, let's get this week into uh, the word of knowledge. Last week was the word of wisdom. This one I'm kind of excited about. Because the word of knowledge is an extremely powerful tool. You know, I talked last week about the fact that I'm feeling the Lord. I'm really, I'm telling you folks, when, when you understand this stuff, 
I've been in this thing a long time. I can't talk about this stuff, but I want to jump up and shout and dance a little while. Woo, I'm feeling good. A word of knowledge is a powerful, powerful tool. I talked last week about the fact that the Pentecostal faith is based on a premise that is very different than a lot of other churches that call themselves Christian. That premise is that God is real. He's as real today as he was when he walked through the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve. He's as real today when he met with Moses on Mount Sinai. He's as real today as when he came down and spoke to Abraham and made a covenant with Abraham. He's as real today as he was the fourth man in the fiery furnace with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He is still a miracle-working God. He is still a real God. He still will speak to his people, and we simply need to learn to hear. A lot of times the Lord speaks to us, but especially if we're young believers and new believers, we haven't yet quite learned to distinguish his voice from our own. A lot of times we think, oh, I had this thought. This thought dropped in my head. And how many times have you said that, you know, you really were puzzling over something, you were really struggling with something, and you were praying about it, and you said, all of a sudden, this thought just dropped into my head. It was like the answer literally just dropped into my head. Tommy has said this to me a couple of times when he was going through different situations at work and everything. And he said, all of a sudden, he said, it was like the answer just went boop, and there it was. And, and boom, I had the answer. See, the thing is, we haven't yet learned to understand. God does not always, he can speak audibly, but God does not always speak audibly. Genu generally, it is, this is part of the reason for the baptism of the Holy Ghost, the baptism of the Holy Ghost provides, listen to me carefully, a spirit-to-spirit -spirit connection. God is a spirit. They that worship him must worship him. How? In spirit and in truth. For, for the Lord uh, to communicate with the Lord at the highest possible level, you need to communicate in the spirit. Now, does that mean... He cannot communicate with somebody who doesn't yet have the Holy Ghost. Oh, no, of course he can. Yes, he can. But when you receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost, I'm going to tell you right now, before too long, you begin to recognize, okay, that wasn't my voice. Especially when you get slapped upside the bottom <laughs> and the Lord is saying, hey, slow your roll there, kid. You don't need to be saying that to that person or you shouldn't have done that, you know. And there are times when he has to correct us. There are times he has to kind of chastise us. He does it in a loving manner. He doesn't beat us. He doesn't, you know, stone us to death over it. But there are times that I've said something or done something and a little while later, boy, I, I feel that internal voice of God saying, you know, you knew better than Wasn't my thinking, it wasn't my head, because I felt perfectly justified in saying it. I felt perfectly justified in doing what I did. But then the Lord comes along and says, no, 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 you knew better than that. And boy, because I've learned to recognize the voice of the Lord, then I'm able to say, okay, Lord, I get it, all right. And that means it's time for me to make some apologies, and Tommy knows it's not... It's not beneath me to apologize if I need to apologize to somebody in the church or even to my booby. A lot of times I have to apologize to him. Probably I need to apologize a lot more than I do, but I try. When I need to, I try. Uh, I'm going to tell you, folks, there's nothing more healing. This is kind of a side note. There is nothing more healing than a simple word of apology. But I wish... As Christians, we need to understand that. If the world doesn't understand it, 
we need to understand that. There is nothing that is as healing as an apology. An apology acknowledges that you're aware you did or spoke wrong. Therefore, you are confessing to the individual you wronged that you acknowledge you did wrong. And according to the Word of God, if you do that, that individual only has one legitimate recourse, and that is to forgive. When somebody comes to you and acknowledges their wrongdoing toward you, you have no option. You do not have the option of holding a grudge. You do not have the option of continuing to be angry over that matter. Uh, you are required by the Lord to forgive. And so anyway, that's a little side note, okay? So word of knowledge. A word of knowledge can serve so many different purposes. But as spirit-filled people, we understand that God is real. And because God is real, and because there are times in our lives we go through circumstances and situations where we can feel like the Lord is far removed from us. You ever been in a situation and you're going through a hard time, boy, and, and you're saying, okay, Lord, where are you? I know you're supposed to be here, Lord, but where are you? I don't see you. I don't feel you. I'm having a hard time right now, Lord. A word of knowledge, one of the functions of a word of knowledge is God letting a believer know, I'm real, I'm here, you're not forgotten. Nothing makes God as real to somebody as a word of knowledge. I'll give you an example. I've, I've shared this in past years, but for those who may have never heard it, uh, my little brother and I had gone to Canton, Texas to visit a dear saint that I had known. Uh, she was in her 80s, and this little lady was this Holy Ghost filled as you as they come you she was an amazing amazing holy ghost filled woman sister chambers uh she and i become good friends i used to drive school bus and during the break in the afternoon she lived near the school bus lot so i would go she was a member of the same church i attended i would go to her house since she lived alone and she and I would visit and have lunch, and she loved my coming by, and she always called me her adopted son, you know. And we would have the most amazing uh, prayer meetings. Oh, my God, have mercy. Some of those afternoons, we just had glory break out in that house, and we had some amazing prayer meetings. Sometimes other people from the church would come by, like Sister Russell one time, and we'd wind up, all three of us, just having a Holy Ghost outpouring. And we'd have an amazing, oh, marvelous prayer meeting. And a spontaneous prayer meeting. And uh, I love to go visit Sister Chambers. And uh, my brother Dallas, my baby brother, and I had moved up the road to another city about 30 minutes away. And this one day I told him, I said, we're going to go down and visit with Sister Chambers today. I said, but when dinner time comes, I said, she'll offer for us to eat with her. I said, but we're not going to stay any. I don't want to eat her food. Because I knew she didn't have a lot. She'd, she'd share everything she had, but I knew she didn't have a lot. And I said, Dallas, I will take you somewhere to eat after, you know. Uh, I'll tell Sister Chambers, well, actually, we need to go and blah, blah, blah. So anyway, we went and visited with her. When dinner time came, she was offering to fix us something to eat. And I said, no, no. I said, as a matter of fact, I, I made a promise to Dallas that we were going to do something. So we'll just go ahead and go, you know. And we parted company. And as we were leaving, I asked Dallas, where would you like to eat? 
And I want to share the whole story with you because I want you to get the full impact of, of how a word of knowledge worked and how God pulled all this together. So Dallas said, well, they just put in a pizza hut over here. Why don't we try that? I said, okay, if that's what you want. So we drove to Pizza Hut. I pulled up in front of Pizza Hut. And I sat in the car for a minute, and I'm sitting there in Dallas and ready to get out of the car. And he looks at me, and he said, what's wrong? And I said, you know, I, I just feel like we're not supposed to eat here. He said, what do you mean we're not supposed to eat here? I said, we're not supposed to eat here. I said, I said I, I've... I've my, the, the, the Lord's laying on my heart that we need to go back to the town we were living in and we need to eat in that town. Now, mind you, all I knew at this point was we need to go back to the town. I didn't know which restaurant. I didn't know. All I knew is we need to go back. So I said, do you mind, Dallas, if we drive the half hour back to Athens and, and we'll... Uh, eat something in Athens. He said, okay. So we drive to Athens. Well, when you get to one intersection in Athens, if you go straight up the road, there's the Dairy Queen on the left-hand side. If you make a right and go up the road a ways, there's the Dairy Queen on that left-hand side. There are two Dairy Queens in town. He and I lived very close to the one if you make a right. And we ate there fairly often. We never, hardly ever ate at the southern one. So I said to him, so what do you think? Should we eat at the, uh, you want to go to the Dairy Queen? You know, do you want to go to the one we never go to just for something different? He said, yeah. I said, okay. So the light turned green. And immediately I started turning the wheel right. And I'm making a right-hand turn. He said, what are you doing? I thought we were going to go. I said, Dallas, I don't know what it is. I said, I just couldn't go straight. I feel like we need to go to this one over here. Now, it's the one we normally go to, you know. Why would it make a difference? Because God was doing something, folks. We get to the Dairy Queen. I All I know at this point in my spirit is, there's somebody here the Lord wants me to talk to. There's somebody here the Lord wants me to minister to. What does he want me to say? I have no idea. What does he want me to do? I have no idea. What does this person look like? I have no idea. Is it a male or a female? I have no idea. Is she old or young? Is he old? I have no idea. We walk in the restaurant. I begin to look around, and I see a lady sitting at a table by herself. And immediately, the Spirit of the Lord speaks to me and says, Her, I want you to talk to her. I said, okay. So I gave Dallas a $20 bill. Back then, two people could eat on $20. This is back in uh, about 87 or so, you know. And uh, show you all how old I am. So I give him a $20 bill. I said, just get me a hamburger, a cheeseburger, you know, whatever. And you get whatever you want. I said, bring the food over to whatever table you want. I said, I'm going to talk to this lady, whatever the Lord wants me to do. I said, then I'll come over and eat with you. I'm walking to this, toward this lady. She's wearing makeup. She's got her hair cut. She's wearing a dress, a skirt and a blouse. You say, well, what difference does that make? Back then I was holiness. Okay. I was into all these rules and regulations and I'm looking at this lady and I'm thinking, she don't look holiness. I may tell her I'm a Pentecostal minister and the Lord sent me to share something with her. She's going to look at me like I'm nuts. For all I know, she's Baptist or Methodist or, uh, or for all I know, she's uh, uh, an atheist. You know, I don't know what her beliefs might be. But I know God wants me to, and I'm going to talk to her regardless, but I'm kind of, you know, I'm going to tell you the enemy, sometimes when you're obeying, the direction of the Holy Ghost. The enemy's going to fight you every step of the way because he's trying to prevent whatever it is God's trying to do. So the enemy's kind of sowing seeds of 
trepidation and fear in me, you know. Well, what if you walk up to her and you tell her that God sent you to talk to her and she doesn't, you know, believe in that kind of stuff. And boy, you're going to look stupid, and, you know. And literally, these kind of thoughts are rushing through my mind. And so I'm, I'm walking through. Well, all of a sudden, a lady walks through the door of the restaurant. And guess what? She's got her hair piled on her head. She's got a long skirt. She's got long sleeves. She goes over to this lady, hugs her neck, and they start talking. And I said, oh, thank you, Jesus. I know she at least knows somebody Pentecostal, because I knew this lady was Pentecostal. I had never visited the United Pentecostal Church in that town yet. It's the church I wound up going to, and it's the church that I truly, genuinely made my transition into the uh, oneness apostolic movement through. So I thought, well, praise God, at least she knows somebody Pentecostal. Well, after a couple of minutes, I, I stood and let them chat. The, the holiness lady leaves, goes to buy something at the counter, and I walk over to the table, and I said to this lady, I said, ma'am, uh, I hope you don't think I'm crazy, I said, but I'm a Pentecostal preacher. I was in Canton this afternoon visiting a friend, and the Spirit of the Lord directed me to this restaurant, pointed at you, and said, he wanted, the Lord wanted me to minister to you. He wants me to talk to you. And she said, oh, praise the Lord, by all means, have a seat. We begin to talk. She's a member of the Holiness Pentecostal Church, the one I wound up going to there. But she didn't look at it. So you'd have never known by looking at her. And so anyway, we're talking. And for just a couple minutes, you know, she tells me, well, I go to this. I said, oh, I said, I'm, I plan on going to that church. I said, I just hadn't been able to get there yet because we're still in the process of moving and blah, blah, blah. I think anyway, we were still in the process of moving. Y'all got to remember the preacher's 57. Details these days are not always as crisp and clear as they were at one time. So anyway, so all of a sudden, the other lady comes over and she says something to the effect of, oh, this lady said to the holiness lady, um, Sister Johnson, this man is a Pentecostal preacher, and he said the Lord sent him here to talk to me today. And so Sister Johnson, who became one of my best friends, said, uh, well, do you mind if I sit in? Is that I said, by all means, because honestly, where I'm ministering to a woman by herself, it's better that there be someone with her as well anyway. So that worked out. God put that together. Everything was perfect. So at this point, I don't know this lady from Jack the Ripper. I don't know anything about her. I don't know nothing. But the Spirit of the Lord just lays on my heart. Reach out and take her hand. I reached out and I took her by the hand. And immediately, God began to pour a word of knowledge through me. And I began to speak a word of knowledge. I began to speak about things which it would be utterly impossible for me to know except for God. That's basically what a word of knowledge is. When something is uttered or spoken and it is clearly God placing that knowledge in that individual because there's no way on earth they could possibly know it otherwise. And I begin to tell her the Spirit of the Lord sent me here today because you have been so broken and so hurt and you have been crying out from a place of utter despair and absolute agony. And the Lord wants you to know, and I'm covered with goosebumps right now. I remember this like it was yesterday. And God wants you to know, honey, that he feels your pain he knows what you're going through. You are not alone in this. And, but there is a decision that you are on the verge of making that is wrong, and you know it. 
but your loneliness and your heartbreak is causing you to feel like you want to make this wrong decision. I don't know the details, but I don't know what I'm talking about. Now, if, if what I'm saying to this lady has absolutely no application, then I'm going to look like a real donkey. This lady begins to weep, and the lady next to her begins to weep, the two of them, because they know what she's been going through. I don't. All of a sudden, the Spirit of the Lord comes in. All three of us are talking in tongues in the middle of a Dairy Queen, and we begin to pray, and we begin, I mean, we're having church in the middle of a Dairy Queen, and my brother got our food, and he's sitting over at the table, and the three of us sitting there holding hands across the table, and we start raising our hands and praying in the Spirit, and these two women are weeping, and the Spirit of the Lord just begins to pour more and more. For I just keep talking. There's more stuff he wants to tell her. But he's letting her know, I listen, in this circumstance, you may feel like I've forgotten you. In this circumstance, you may feel like you're all alone and that I'm not seeing and that your pain is something that I'm asking you to go through all by yourself, but you're not. Well, I'm going to tell you, let me tell you, oh, I'm going to tell you. There have been a lot of times in my life I'd have been thrilled to have gotten a word of knowledge like this. After we had church, <laughs> this lady began to explain to me. She said, about a year or two before, she said, I was married for 20, 25 years, something like that. She said, I attended this church with my husband for all these years. We raised our family. We have children that are married and have children. She said, my husband was a good Pentecostal Christian man. She said, all of a sudden, one day, he came home, pulled a suitcase out of the closet, started packing it, said, our marriage is over. I'm filing for divorce. She said, I literally had no clue. She said, we, it's not like we had been arguing. It's not like we had had, you know, any kind of tension or anything. She said, I literally was happily married and thought everything was great. She said, and then all of a sudden my husband's telling me that our marriage is over and he's leaving. She said, I was so flabbergasted and so floored by this. She said, then he left our house, moved down the road a few miles, and moved in with a younger woman. She said, before too long, I found out the younger woman he's living with now is pregnant. Now, here this man is, you know, in his, he's got to be in his mid-40s at least, right? And... He's, he's leaving his wife after all these years of marriage, going to church, good Christian man, everything, you know. This woman was devastated by this. She wasn't hurt. She was devastated by this. She said, then, as if that wasn't enough, a while later, he showed up at the church we used to attend together for 20-something years with his new wife and baby in arm and walked in and sat down on the pew like he belonged there. Didn't care one bit about the fact that he had devastated me and our children and our family and, you know, just all of a sudden he's like, well, I'm going to come back to church and I'm going to be a good Christian man again. You know, I got a new wife, got a new baby. Here's the poor devastated left wife, you know, and she said, I have been so broken over this whole thing. She said, honestly, she said, in a lot of ways, I kind of rebelled against God. She said, I went and cut my hair, you know, things that holiness women don't do. That's why I, looking at her, I couldn't tell, you know, and she said, you know, I, I, I've done some things and blah, 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 and she said, um, 
And then there's a man I know who is a Catholic man. And he really is crazy about me, she said. And he actually proposed marriage to me. And I've been mulling it over. And she said, literally, I had just decided that I would say yes, not because I was in love with him or anything, but because I was so hurt and so devastated by this whole experience. And I felt like God had just abandoned me. And she said, basically, it was like, well, Lord, you know, if you're just going to abandon me, then I'll just marry this Catholic man. Uh, even though I know spiritually we're not on the same page by any stretch of the, of the imagination, you know, and she said, because I'm lonely and I'm hurt and I'm, you know, blah, 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 blah. She said, but then Jesus sent me a preacher in the middle of a Dairy Queen. And he let me know that God is aware of my pain. And he's aware of my loneliness. And he's aware that I'm broken. That he has not abandoned me. God just made himself real to me like he's never made himself real to me in my life. She said, and I know in my spirit, you said you're about to make a decision that you know is the wrong decision. She said, and that is exactly what I was about to do. She said, because I knew I should not accept this proposal. But I was about to do it just out of hurt, just out of... She said, oh, but brother, she said, oh, my God, when you spoke those words from the Lord, she said, it was just like the weight of the world lifted off me. She said, oh, my God. Oh, it's, she said, all these years of pain and agony, she said, it's literally like all of that has just been relieved. Do you see what a word of knowledge can do? Word of knowledge can come at a time when you really need God to demonstrate and manifest himself as real. And you really need something substantive. You know, you, you need, it's like, Lord, it's all well and good to live by faith and, you know, to walk by faith. But, Lord, I'm about to lose my mind and I need you to make yourself real to me. And I've had experiences when I was a teenager, uh, and the Lord, I've told this story before. Again, for those who may not have heard it, I was on a bus coming back to Texas after going back to Connecticut with my mother. I've shared that story with you before. And I was on a bus coming back. I didn't have the money to fly back, so the second time I came, I had to come by Greyhound. And I'm on a bus. And there was a holiness lady on the bus. And I began to talk to her. And I asked her where she went to church and all. And uh, she said she went to a, a Methodist church. And I thought, oh boy, I called this one wrong. And then she said, but, she said, I'm actually Pentecostal. She said, but my son recently moved me closer to him. And I'm living in a new place. She said, and there's no Pentecostal church real handy. So when I can't get away to the Pentecostal church, she said, uh, there's a real sweet little Methodist church in town. She said, and they put up with me. They let me raise my hands in worship and they let me worship. She said, so I really love these people and I appreciate them. She said, so that's why I said, you know, when you ask me where I go to church, I said this Methodist church. So she and I were talking, and I told her, I said, you know, the Lord called me to Texas, and then my mother came down, and she wanted to come back to Connecticut, and blah, 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 and I kind of told her the whole story. I said, and, uh, and then uh, now I'm on my way back because he gave me the money to come back. And we were coming up on her stop. And this lady looked at me and she said, Chuck, stay on the path you're on. Keep obeying the voice of the Lord because you're on the right path. You're doing the right thing. 
and she got off at her stop. And I sat there, and my jaw was on the floor because in the course of our conversation, I never once told her my name. I never mentioned my name. But see, the Lord dropped that word of knowledge in her spirit. She spoke something she couldn't know. And that was a sign to me that the words that follow, <laughs> stay on this path, keep following the Lord. He's leading you. You know, you're doing the right thing was coming from him. You follow what I'm trying to say? And there are times when the Lord will do this. And a word of knowledge, something comes through somebody that you know they cannot possibly have known in the flesh. They could not possibly have known naturally. And it can relieve fear. It can relieve worry. It can give you direction. It can encourage you. It can inspire. I mean, a word of knowledge can serve so many functions. It's not even funny. We had a man in the church I grew up in by the name of Brother Omar. I loved Brother Omar. He is a little guy. And Brother Omar was a humble fellow. He was a sweet, sweet, spirit-filled Pentecostal man. He had been a, a friend of my grandparents for decades. He and his wife had been friends of my grandparents for decades. Sometimes they'd come over and visit, you know. They were members of the church I grew up in for many, many, many decades. Brother Omar, regularly, the Lord would use him with a word of knowledge. And every time, Brother Omar would start, he'd start by saying to the people that the Lord laid on his heart to speak to, he'd say, I have no idea why I'm saying this. All I know is this is what God told me to tell you. And he would tell them. And it would hit right on the money, 100% on the money. I'll give you one example. We had a couple in our church, a brother and sister Star. I don't think she'll mind me telling this. Um, brother Star has passed away many years ago. Good people. I loved them too. They were. I loved all the people in the church I grew up in. There wasn't anybody there I didn't love. Good people. And... Brother Star had been married before he met Sister Star. He had a son, I believe it was, from a previous marriage. And then he divorced and he married this lady, Sister Star. Well, back in the 70s and the 60s and the 80s, in most churches, not just Pentecostals, in most churches, if you were divorced, especially women, they looked at you like you were the town whore. Seriously, folks, some of you young people don't understand this. It wasn't that long ago. If a person was divorced, there was only one reason for it, and that was because they were immoral. They didn't know how to stay married. They didn't know how to keep their commitment to their spouse, and they were immoral. They had the hots. They were wanting to play the field. I mean, this is the ignorance and the stupidity. If you think the attitudes today toward LGBT people is something new, no, 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 no. No. Before LGBT people became the target, divorced people were very much the target. I have an aunt who divorced her husband. He committed adultery with another woman, and she divorced him on biblical grounds. However, she told me she wouldn't even go back to church for a couple of years because divorce was so looked down upon, and those who divorced were looked you know, at in such negative ways. She wouldn't even walk back into the church. It took her a while to gather up the courage to go back to church. And if a divorced person remarried, oh my God, you committed the unpardonable sin. Oh, that was the worst thing you could ever do. And a divorced person who was remarried, oh my goodness. 
you might can come to church and be in the church, but the pastor better not tap you to do anything. You can't teach Sunday school. You can't be a worker in the children's church. You can't be a worship leader. You can't do nothing in the church if you're divorced or remarried. Well, this particular couple, our pastor would use Brother Star as uh, to lead worship sometimes. And he was a wonderful, oh, he was a wonderful Sunday school teacher for the uh, young men's class, the teenage boys class. I had him as a teacher. He was a wonderful. That man tried so hard to motivate the boys and give us, he gave prizes out that he spent his own money buying, you know. And he would do these little contests and stuff. And, and, and I used to win a lot of them. Honestly, I'm not joking. I really did. I won a lot of them. But he wanted my brother Michael to, to really get engaged and to get involved. So he literally went to my mother and he said, what kind of a prize would I need to offer to get Michael interested in trying to win it? And my mother told him, Michael loves plastic model cars, you know, that you glue together and all that. And she said, he loves model cars. So brother, Star went out and bought a model car. Guess what? Oh, my brother, won. he wanted to win that model car. And the only way to win it, you had to memorize scripture verses. You had to answer questions. You know, he had to do And he won that car. But see, Brother Star, that man had such love in his heart for those kids. He wanted all of them. He was trying to reach people, you know. But he was divorced and remarried. People in the church. I got you. Pastor said to you. And of course, it got back to them. It wasn't like they didn't know. People were griping and complaining. Some people would go to the pastor and complain. You know, you shouldn't be using him. He's a divorced man. Remarried. Blah, blah, blah. Well, Sister Starr told me the story herself. She said, Chuck, my husband and I got so disgruntled with all the negativity and all the judgment and all the criticism. She said that we seriously began to think about leaving the Pentecostal church altogether and going to a church that had a little bit more liberal a position on divorce and remarriage. Well, they had to go into an Episcopal or, you know, something really uh, catholic -y, you know, to find a church that, it, I mean, they have been abandoning the Pentecostal faith entirely. And she said, but we were so hurt, constantly being attacked, constantly. She said that we seriously were really said we were literally about a week or two, Sunday or two away from leaving the Pentecostal church forever. She said, but one Sunday, Brother Obar came up to us. And Brother Obar said to us, I don't know why the Lord told me to tell you this, but this is what he told me to tell you. Stand still. Don't make any moves. Stay right where you are. This is going to change. It will be better soon. She said, My husband and I felt the Holy Ghost. We knew we had just heard a word of knowledge. We knew he had no idea what was going on in our heads. And yet, what he just spoke addressed what was going on in our heads to the T. And she said, so we stayed. She said, and don't you know, things did get better and attitudes did change and all. She said, but you know what? She said, the thing that really kills me is one of my daughters wound up marrying a Pentecostal preacher. And becoming a preacher's wife. My other daughter married a Pentecostal missionary and wound up becoming a missionary. 
She said, see how the enemy was trying to use this divisiveness and this division and this issue to push us out of the church. She said, what if we had done that? What if we had made that move? What could my kids have missed out on? What? How could our lives have forever been changed? Because they would have been knocked out of the will of God. You see, this is what a word of knowledge, folks, can do for you. A word of knowledge can come at just the right time, at exactly the right time. Then a word of knowledge can also manifest itself in a, shall I say, less obvious way. And I mentioned sometimes the Lord will use somebody in a word of wisdom or in a word of knowledge, and they don't even realize it. I began to attend an apostolic church many years ago. It was the church I later was baptized in the name of the Lord in. And uh, I had not yet been baptized in Jesus' name. It was my first visit to their church. And it was a Bible study like this one. It was being conducted in one of their church members' homes because uh, the pastor rented out a dance studio for Sunday, you know. But for midweek, they did it in Sister Gloria's home. I didn't know one single person in that room. It was my first time ever meeting any of them. So they're starting out the servant, the meeting, and the pastor is asking for prayer requests, you know. And there's an Asian lady sitting here, and she says, uh, Pastor, remember me and my husband and that thing we're going through. She said, we really need the Lord to move in this situation. That's all she said. Well, Brother Brought, <laughs> he turns around and says, well, I know it's your first time here, Brother Chuck. I had met him. I worked at a, at a car dealership in the car rental department, and he had come to rent a van to take people to a United Pentecostal uh, camp meeting. And when he'd come to rent the van, I asked him if he'd mind if I went with him. So that's how I met him, you know. But this uh, Asian lady was not there. She didn't go to that meeting. I didn't meet her or anything. So anyway, so he said, I know it's your first time with us. He said, but I'm going to ask you to lead us in prayer. So all of a sudden now, I'm trying to remember all the prayer requests, you know, everybody... And so what I'm doing is I started praying, and I'm kind of looking at each individual, and I'm trying to remember what they said, who to pray for and all that. When I looked at the Asian lady, I began to pray. I said, and Lord, this lady, God, you see that the government is investigating her husband for criminal activity, and you know, Lord, he's not guilty. And if they should find him guilty, they're going to deport these people back to China. I'm literally saying all these words. I don't even know where it's coming from. She never said one ounce of these. Never said anything about any of this. And I'm speaking detailed, detailed about her husband's under criminal investigation. You know, they could be sent back to China. Lord, we need you to intervene. I didn't even know what country she's from, and I'm saying China. What if she was Korean? What if she was Japanese? What, you know you know how people do, you know. And when I got done praying and we said amen, Sister Brock, the pastor's wife, said to that Asian girl, she said, oh, honey, she reached over, she said, honey, you've got this. God's going to answer this prayer. And uh, the woman said something to the effect of, I hope so. And Sister Brown said, oh, no, 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 no. It's not I hope so. She said, he just spoke a word of knowledge. She said, that man doesn't know you. He doesn't know anything about you. He just prayed for your situation and spoke every detail of it. Every detail of it. Like he knew everything you were going through. She said, when God speaks through somebody like that, 
in a word of knowledge, that is a supernatural sign to you that I've got this covered. Hallelujah. You see? So a word of knowledge can be a wonderful, wonderful, powerful, powerful thing. Uh, it can help to encourage people when you're at your darkest hour. It can, uh, you know, I've even said to Tommy over the years, we've been going through some hard times at different points, and I've even said to him, what I wouldn't give for somebody to come with a word of knowledge right about now and just let me know, hey, you know, somebody that wouldn't have any way in the world of knowing and say, hey, you know what? The Lord told me to tell you that he knows what you're going through with this move. He knows what, you know what I'm saying? That would have really blessed me and that would have really encouraged me with everything we were going through. I didn't get one, but I'd have loved one. And then I'll try to seal this up with, uh, I'm going to go back to the example I talked about Sunday of Brother uh, uh Dr. C.M. Ward, a very, very high, very famous uh, figure within the Pentecostal movement, uh, especially within the Assemblies of God in particular. And I shared Sunday, so I won't go into all the detail. If you want to hear it in detail, then watch uh, the video of Sunday service. I, I'm going to, uh, I shared it in much more detail Sunday than I'm going to right now. I'll try to keep it brief. But anyway, Dr. Ward, I had been praying and asking the Lord. I said, Lord, please, please use somebody, somebody I admire, somebody I really look up to in ministry. Use them to confirm that you called me to preach because I had a terrible nervous condition as a young person. And I just, for the life of me, I was about 12 years old. God had called me to preach when I was eight, and I just couldn't imagine how God was ever, ever, ever going to be able to use me as a preacher. And uh, I began to question my calling. And so I told the Lord, I asked the Lord, I said, Lord, please, please speak through somebody. I didn't realize that in essence I was asking for a word of knowledge, but that's what I was doing. And I said, just speak through somebody that I really admire and let them tell me that you have told them that I am, in fact, called to preach. Well, Sunday after Sunday would come for months on end. And honestly, I kept waiting to see if my pastor, because I always loved my pastors growing up as a kid. And so I kept waiting to see if Brother Barlow was going to say one day to me, you know, Chuck, the Lord told me to tell you, you know, but he didn't. Then all of a sudden, my pastor brings in one of the most famous Pentecostal preachers in the world. One of the greatest men of God I've ever known in my life. To this day, I love to go online and listen, there aren't a whole lot of recordings of him preaching. Um, uh, uh, there's not video. There is audio. You can go on YouTube and look up Dr. C.M. Ward. And you can listen to him preaching, but there's not video uh, as a rule. He used to appear on the PTL Club, Jim and Tammy's program way back in the day. Uh, this man was world famous marvelous man of God, wonderful, wonderful wordsmith, you know. And long story short, after the service that he did for our church, you know, I go running up to him just as he's about to get in the car and leave with our pastor. It was the earliest opportunity I had to, to talk to him at all. And uh, I reached out to shake his hand and thank him for coming to preach for us and how honored we were. And he reached out and he took my hand in his and then he, he placed his left hand over the top of my hand and he looked right at me and he said, Young man, the Holy Ghost has informed me to tell you that God has 
called you to the ministry. Holy Toledo. Sweetie, you couldn't have put wings on my feet and had me go home any higher that night. And I did that day. Dr. C.M. Ward. And the way he said it, it was exactly what I had asked God for. There's no way in the universe he could know that. There's no way in the world he could know that this kid who's got a nervous condition makes him look nuts is waiting on the Lord to speak through someone he admires and let him know that, yes, son, I have called you to preach. You know what I'm saying? The Lord can use the word of knowledge in so many ways. There are so many applications for a word of knowledge. Um, I'll, I'll give one more quick example, and then we'll move next week on to the next gift. I talked about Sister Chambers. That little lady, boy, I'm going to tell you, that little lady was so full of the Holy Ghost. I don't know how she didn't sprout wings and fly to glory decades before she did because I honestly, I'm not kidding. This lady was a true, honest to God example of what a Holy Ghost filled believer is. There was a young man in uh, East Texas who had gotten hit by a car, and I had a burden for this boy before. We even found out that a boy had been hit by a car. The Lord literally, on I believe it was on the, the Friday night, had shown me, I was praying at my house, and I literally saw almost like a movie screen came down in a sense. And I saw an image in front of me of a little boy lying on the road with a bike nearby and a big tractor trailer truck up the road a little ways and, and a car and the boy was laying there like he was dead and all I could see I couldn't see his face all I could see was his hand and I looked at his hand and my, my brother Dallas used to like me I, I've had a nervous uh, habit since I was a kid of nibbling on my nails I still do it and uh, Dallas had always done that and his hands had a certain look and because I've always done it I know what Dallas's hands look like and when I saw this vision I thought it was my brother and it terrified me and so I ran that night late at night it's probably one o'clock in the morning now if you're not Pentecostal you're not spirit-filled you can think this is crazy as you want to doesn't bother me in the least honey I said it before I'll say it again God is real to me. I, I don't have any problem. You can think this is all a bunch of horseradish. Whatever evil thoughts you want to think, think them. I've lived it. I know. And I went to my mother's house, and it was raining. And I went to my brother's window in the rain, and I'm tapping on his window, and I woke him up. And he come to the window and said, what are you doing? I said, honey, open the door. Let me in. I said, I need to pray with you. So I come in the house and he's saying, what's wrong? what's wrong? I didn't want to tell him. I didn't want, you know, I didn't want to worry him. But I thought, oh Lord, I think the Lord showed me that Dallas could potentially be hit by a car, you know, riding his bike. So anyway, so I'm sitting with Dallas on the bed and I'm starting to want to pray. And all of a sudden the Spirit of the Lord speaks to me and says, it's not your brother. He said, but I want you to pray like it was. So I looked at Dallas. I said, oh, Dallas, I said, it's not you. I said, but God wants me to pray for whoever this that I saw. I said, he wants me to pray for that kid like he was you. So I began to pray. And I said, Lord, you know, this somebody's going to get hit by a car. And I'm beginning to pray for this kid even before it's happened. That's how real God is, folks. And so then I went home that night. The next day, Saturday, uh, I don't know nothing. Sunday morning, I go to church. I go to Sunday school. 
and I have such a burden for this kid. I don't know who this kid is, but my heart is so heavy for this kid that I can't even explain what's going on. I mean, my heart is just breaking for this kid who's gotten or who's going to get hit, whatever, by a car. I mean, by uh, riding his bike, you know, hit by a vehicle. And then all of a sudden in Sunday school, one of the people says, let's remember, and I know the boy's name, but I'm not going to say it because I don't, I don't want to, you know, it could, if, it, if any family member were to hear this or something, you know, I don't want to stir up negative feelings, bad feelings. Um, this young boy in our town was hit last night by a car. He tried to cross the road on his bike after a tractor trailer truck passed him. He was looking up that way, but he couldn't see the car because the truck obstructed him. And as he crossed the road, this car hit him. And they said he's lying uh, brain dead in a hospital in Dallas. I'd never been to Dallas. I'd never driven to Dallas before. Uh, I lived in Fort Worth and I lived in East Texas. I, I might have gone through Dallas a time or two, but I never, never, never spent time in Dallas or anything. And so when church time came, I had such a burden for this kid. Oh my goodness, I had such a burden for this kid. And I couldn't even worship. I couldn't even have church. I, I literally put my tambourine down. I was on the platform because the pastor liked all of us to be on the platform, include me with my tambourine, even though I was happy to be in the congregation with it. And I literally just put down my tambourine, got on my knees and began to pray right up there on the platform while everybody else is singing and all. And after a while, the pastor, Brother Allen, said, folks, he said, I don't know if you noticed, he said, but Brother Chuck has gotten down and has been praying. He said, I feel such a heaviness, such a burden, such a spirit of intercession. He said, we need to pray. The whole church needs to pray. And he called, and all the people come down to the altar, the whole church is praying. They don't know what they're praying about. I'm the only one that knows what I saw a day before. The spirit of the Lord lays on my heart. You need to go see Destry. You need to go see this boy. And uh, I said, Lord, I don't have any gas. I don't have gas. And back then, the car I had was a real gas guzzler. And, uh, and I didn't have a dime. I didn't have any money for gas or anything. So Sister Chambers comes to me after church and said, come over to my house for lunch. I said, okay. I go over to her house. As soon as I walk through the door, she hands me a $20 bill. And she said, go buy gas. The Lord wants you to go to see that boy. Oh, I want to tell you, when God's church is operating in the spirit, when the gifts of the spirit are operating in the church, folks, I'm telling you, oh, I'm going to tell you, God is so real, and you will see miraculous things happening on a regular basis. I have lived this my entire life. I have seen things like this so many times, I can't even begin to tell you how many times I've seen things like this happen. It's, this is one reason why one of many reasons why I know the enemy has been fighting the ministry that we've been trying to build for all these years because folks I'm going to tell you something I don't care about First Assembly God down the road I don't care about First UPC down the road I don't care about First Baptist or First Methodist all I know is a church cannot go any further. I talked about this a couple Sundays ago. A church cannot go any further than the pastor. 
If you have a pastor who does not appreciate the move of God, who doesn't appreciate the uh, outpouring of the Holy Ghost, and believe it or not, there are preachers who don't. <laughs> a lot of them in today's world, they want to control the service. They want everything to be according to their little program. They don't understand what it is to let God be God. And that was one of the first lessons Brother Gillum taught me. Let God be God. He said, man, if God wants to do something in a church service different than your program, then you go with God. Don't go with your program. He said, because honey, there ain't nothing, nothing you can do that's going to outdo what God wants to do. This preacher is old timey. There's a lot of people in the LGBT community don't appreciate that fact. They'd rather I be more modern. They'd rather I be more soft spoken. They'd rather I be more uh, Joel Osteen like, I'm sure. The only problem with that is you don't see the gifts of the Spirit operating in some of these TV churches like God wants to move. I know what the Lord wants to do. I know the kind of church God wants to have. That is my goal. That is my objective. My objective is a church where the gifts of the Spirit are in operation, where God's people are empowered, where we're casting out devils, laying hands on the sick, and seeing them recover, where the gifts of the Spirit are at work, where people are being encouraged, and God is able to make Himself real, because we know how to walk in the Spirit and in the power of the Holy Ghost. That's my objective. And I'm sorry if that doesn't mesh with modern LGBT thinking. But honey, I wouldn't want to be part of a church any less than that. I've got issues in my body that I've had now for years, including diabetes and, you know, what have you. I've told Tommy, cancer, leukemia, I'm living with chronic leukemia. I've told Tommy, I said, what I wouldn't do to be part of a church where the gifts of the Spirit are in operation, where the Lord is moving, because, honey, I'll tell you what happens to people like me. All one Sunday you go to church, and the Lord will just put everything together, and the gifts of the Spirit will be at work, and somebody with the gift of faith or somebody with the gift of healings is going to minister to you and you're going to get what you've been waiting years for. But God works through a body. There's a reason why God doesn't invest all the gifts in one person. You put all the gifts in one person, they're going to think they're Jesus. Am I telling the truth? I know I am. You put all the gifts in one person, and there's a real danger of pride. There's a real danger of them thinking more highly of themselves than they, than they ought. There's a reason why God works through various members this way. And some have this, and some have that, and some operate in this, and others operate in that. There's a reason for this. And I have craved and I have longed for a body of sincere, passionate, Holy Ghost-filled people, LGBT, straight and otherwise. Because I know in a church like that, I'm going to get what I need. And the enemy is sure as murder made certain that we haven't realized that vision yet. I'm talking tonight about a word of knowledge. Boy, I'm going to tell you. Whew. There is nothing in this world that will tickle your soul more than the Lord speaking to you through someone with a word of knowledge. If you ever, ever wondered if God was real. And, I, and I'm going to finish with this thought real quick. It's not quite nine, so... 
I've got a couple minutes. Another thing that I really wanted to share, because this is important, and I will be abundantly frank here, folks, all right? And I hope people don't get offended, but I'm going to be real, 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 real frank. There are a lot of people run around the church calling themselves prophets. And most of the time, what these people are doing is, and I'm not saying the Lord isn't using them. I'm not saying that at all. But he's using them with a word of knowledge for people. And a word of knowledge and prophecy are not even close. They're not, they, they don't serve the same function. Remember, we talk about their diversities of gifts, their diversities of administrations, you know, so on and so forth. Prophecy, and we're going to get there, serves a very, very, very different function. And if the Lord uses someone regularly with a word of knowledge, that does not mean they are a prophet. Not even close. And in a lot of minority churches, if I can say it that way, uh, this is a, an extremely common mistake that is made. Extremely common. The Lord uses somebody in the word of knowledge and they, they uh, are obedient to the leading of the Holy Ghost. And when the Lord plays something, they speak it to the person, you know. And so the Lord uses them more and more and more because they're obedient, you know. And then all of a sudden they put a shingle up next to their door saying, oh, I'm prophet so-and-so, prophet nothing. You're no more a prophet than you are a bumper on a car. A word of knowledge and prophecy are not even close when it comes to their purpose and their administration and their function, okay? And prophecy is one of the gifts that you own. It's one of the gifts that God literally endows an individual. This is why someone with a gift of prophecy can literally be referred to as a prophet. And uh, uh, we're going to get into that on because prophecy is one subject, by the way, that we're going to cover in great detail over the course of time because it is one of the gifts that uh, is extremely important to the church. The Apostle Paul says that prophecy is, uh, in fact, the most important gift. He said, of all the gifts, he said, you can pray and ask God to use you. Pray and ask God to give you a gift or to operate through you with a gift. He said, but above all else, Pray that you might prophesy, because prophecy is extremely, extremely valuable to the church. And, uh, and word of knowledge does not serve any purpose even remotely close to prophecy. So when you see somebody getting up and telling people, you know, the Lord told me to tell you this, and so that's not prophecy. That's not, that's a word of knowledge. That is not prophecy. All right? So it's important to understand the distinction. Yes? Um, before we close, one person asked if you could just talk briefly about the church um, and uh, restate the meeting time, service times. Okay. So, yeah, I always close our meetings with a little bit of information about that. Our ministry is brand new to the Huntsville, Decatur, Alabama area. Uh, we are obviously a spirit-filled Pentecostal ministry. Uh, my partner and I have been together for nearly 22 years. I've been involved in LGBT-affirming spirit-filled ministry 
since 1993. So this year marked my 30th year since I began my foray into uh, LGBT affirming ministry. Uh, right now we have a uh, office warehouse space in a little complex in Decatur, Alabama. It's about 25, 30 minutes outside of uh, Huntsville. Um, Huntsville is extremely, um, it's expensive, all right? Space in Huntsville is expensive. Meeting space, hotels and motels and stuff in Huntsville are really ridiculously expensive. That's one option we, we would otherwise look at. Um, so we have an office warehouse. We've converted the warehouse space into uh, a, a sanctuary that will accommodate about 40 or so. Uh, we videotape our services there live Sundays at 3 o'clock p.m. Uh, we do our, our Bible studies in our home on Wednesday night at 7 p.m. You're welcome to be with us either way. Uh, but if you want to come to Bible study, we ask that you either send us an email at forwardclc, all one word, at yahoo.com, or give us a call at 256-755-5725, and send me a text, and we will shoot you the address by text for our home. We do that because, frankly, Alabama is uh, not as gay-friendly as a lot of places. So if a person has to request the address, if anything were to happen, you know, and I don't mean somebody get killed, but even if somebody were to attack us or, or, or vandalize our home, at least we have a record on our phone of who has requested our physical address. You follow what I'm saying? So that's why we do that, okay? Uh, just shoot us a message on our phone or give us a call or send us a text message, uh, uh, email, and we'll be more than happy to text you the address so you can just hit it and your GPS will take you right there. Uh, our space where we videotape our services is located at 1931 uh, Central Parkway Southwest here in Decatur, Alabama, 35601. We are in Unit I, not Unit 1. When you look at it on paper or on the website, <clears throat> a lot of people confuse it, but the spaces in this little uh, complex are labeled with letters. They're not labeled with numbers. So it's space I. Uh, we are kind of in the back. So you drive around the front portion of the building to the right. It's a little uh, barber shop there on the right hand side. And you'll see our space back there on the left hand side. Uh, unit I. We do put a sign in the window on Sunday. And there is a sign up overhead as well. But if you miss the one overhead, then you should be able to see the one in the window. We desperately need, folks, um, we need people to help us. You know, I've been doing affirming ministry, honestly, um, pretty much by myself for, for all these years. Now, of course, I don't mean Tommy isn't very much a part of our work. He is. But most of what he does is behind the scenes, helping us videotape and that sort of thing. Um, but we need people to help us with leading worship. I would love to have people who sing specials. Uh, I would love to have people to share testimonies. I would love to have people who would like to eventually be part of a choir. I'd like to have people that want to be part of a worship team. We desperately need musicians. Um, we don't have a big budget, but I am happy to give a stipend if we can get somebody to come out regularly who is dependable. Um, and if you're able to play keyboard or, or organ or piano, whatever, we will provide an electronic keyboard. 
um, a good one, not a, not a complete piece of junk. It'll be a nice one. We actually have it. I just hadn't set it up yet. Um, it would be best if you're somebody who's familiar with uh, spirit-filled worship because in our church we shout and get happy. And uh, if you're somebody that doesn't come from a spirit-filled background and the preacher gets happy, it might scare the fire out of you and you'll quit playing and don't know what to do. But if you come from a spirit-filled background, you know to just keep playing and let the Lord move, you know. And um, we have no issue with the race of the individual, the age of the individual, the gender of the individual, the sexual orientation or gender identification of the individual. This church is open and affirming and welcoming of all people, uh, and we do mean all, and you are included in every aspect of the church. There are no second-class citizens in this church, okay? So if you are an LGBT person and you want to participate playing an instrument, you know, helping with our worship leading or what have you, you are welcome to do, or singing a special, whatever the case might be, you are welcome to do so, okay? Uh, we do not have second-class citizens. And um, so I don't know if that answers all of your questions, but I hope that it does. Folks, I appreciate your being with us tonight. I need to bring this to a close. It's after 9 o'clock. Um, I hope this has been a blessing. If you would, shoot me a little thumbs up or a heart or a smiley face or something to let us know that the service uh, was a blessing, the Bible study was a blessing to you. We're always appreciative of any feedback that we receive. Um, I hope you'll be with us Sunday at 3 o'clock Central Standard Time. Of course, on Sunday, we broadcast live on both Facebook and our YouTube channel. We're hoping to eventually do that on uh, Wednesday night as well, but we haven't been able to quite work out the logistics yet, but we're working on it. And then uh, you can also be with us Wednesday night at 7 o'clock, again, Central Standard Time, for a time of Bible study, okay? Let's just close with a quick word of prayer. Master, we love you, God. We love the word of the Lord. We love God that we today as a spirit-filled people understand that our God is real. We serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. I know that he is risen, whatever men may say. Master, today, God, you've been real to me since I was a child, and you've been there for me so many times. My life has been spared by miracles. I've been healed and delivered so many times. I come from a family, God, of people who have experienced miracle after miracle after miracle. I grew up on the testimonies of my grandfather who experienced uh, just wonderful healing and healings and miracles throughout the course of his life. And oh God, I've seen so much. Nobody can tell me that my God is not real. I've seen too much. I've seen too much. I'm grateful for the gifts of the Spirit. I'm grateful, God, that you have given us tools and you've given us gifts that allow Lord, for you personally to speak to your church, to encourage your church, to instruct your church, at times to rebuke and chastise if necessary. But Lord, you are the head of your church. You don't need some uh, man-made committee to speak for you. When you need to speak to the church, God, you have provided us with gifts that allow you to communicate directly to your people. And Master, today I hope, I pray, Lord, that this Bible study has been a blessing to those who have participated live. I pray that it will be a blessing to those who later watch by reason of the Internet. Help us, Lord to understand that which we've been teaching and help us as the word of the Lord declares 
to desire gifts, to desire, Lord, that you might work through us, speak through us, be a blessing and an encouragement to the body of Christ through us. Lord, in the name of Jesus, we ask all these things. Amen. Praise God and amen. Hope to see you Sunday at 3 o'clock or Wednesday at 7. God bless you in Jesus' name. It's our prayer.